Everyone, thank you for coming to our talk. My name is Iron Schneider. I'm the CTO and co-founder of a company called Diagrid. And we are commercializing the Dapper open source project, which I helped create uh, while I was at Microsoft before Diagrid. And together with me here, we have... Uh, I'm Arthur. I'm head of engineering for Diagrid. And we're happy to... Also, also yeah. of Dapper. Yes, we're both maintainers of Dapper. Um, I'm a steering committee member of the project. Arthur was a steering committee member of the project in the past. We're happy to be here and help you talk about how we do quality control and testing um, in what we call a multi-cloud runtime. So what is a multi-cloud runtime? Dapper is an example of one, but it might just be any sort of application that is deployed to a multi-cloud environment, needs to talk to uh, multiples of you know, services, cloud providers, libraries, they interact with the underlying cloud infrastructure. It's essentially anything that can run in a cloud environment needs to interact with either multiple services within that cloud environment or across cloud environments. And so this comes with lots of challenges because you need to start writing you know, a different layer in your application to interact with that infrastructure, to secure it, to make it reliable. And there's lots of you know, examples from that. Let's take Kubernetes, for example. Kubernetes is obviously a multi-cloud runtime because, well, it interacts with the cloud infrastructure. Kubernetes has a cloud provider uh, layer that interacts with things like network, compute, and storage from the cloud provider. Uh, upon which it runs. Dapper is a really good example um, because it does uh, over 150 different connect connections to all of these cloud services. And uh, if we really look at Dapper, and we're going to talk about how we're doing testing in Dapper today, but I assure you, you can take all of the lessons here to your applications, uh, whether they're using Dapper or not. Um, Dapper is a set of APIs for developers to encapsulate distributed systems challenges. Instead of you needing to write the same old boilerplate code that needs to interact with a database or a pub sub or a configuration store or a secrets management store, Dapper gives you these best practices encapsulated in a set of APIs that you can use to run on top of any cloud or edge infrastructure. It can run as a single binary on your machine, on a VM, um, or on Kubernetes with a control plane, and you can really use it from any type of programming language. Um, and this is essentially what Dapper does. You have your application here on the left. You have a Dapper instance, can really run anywhere on the right. And you have a bunch of APIs that Dapper exposes, for example, to discover services or to get state and save state, uh, to publish and subscribe to topic messages and do secrets management. This is four APIs out of nine that Dapper has, including leader election, uh, workflows as code, kind of like a temporal uh, kind of thing. And um, behind all of these things, there is a wide array of different infrastructure components that you can hook up Dapper to. So, for example, if you're running in AWS, as a developer, you get a single consistent API. You can basically tell Dapper, hey, Dapper, I want you to work against DynamoDB. Then once you deploy to a different environment, for example, let's say you're deploying to OpenShift on-premises, you can tell Dapper, hey, I want you to work against Cassandra. And if we're deploying to Azure, it can be Azure Cosmos DB, Google Firebase, you get the gist. These are just some examples here on the right, but as I said earlier, Dapper supports over 150 um, of these components. This text is outdated. We should change that. Um, and so new components are getting added by the community as the community grows, and Dapper really is a very large project in CNCF. I think we're the 12th largest project today. Um, lots of companies are investing in it, uh, contributing to the different cloud connectivity components that Dapper has. And we need to assert control over that, and we need to make sure that everything is properly tested and that it's, you know, uh, that it's uh, meeting our quality. Why? Because very large organizations, including NASA, NVIDIA, PwC, and many others are using Dapper in production today. It's powering up the entire cloud infrastructure for FAS for Alibaba Cloud. Um, also, Microsoft Azure running it as a managed service. So it's powering up some pretty critical infrastructure today. And we, as open source maintainers, need to make sure that every line of code that gets committed in the project is very, very well tested um, and that we check for regressions. And so how do we do that? Um, well, we start off with unit tests, right? That's the most basic form of testing that we can have. And, you know, one of the things that I like the most, and of course I'm being very cynical here, just want to make that clear, um, is, you know, discussions like, oh, we should have 80% of code tested or 75%. And you come up with a magic number that's basically like, oh, we should have, you know, 95%. Some people, the, you know, very brave people are like, oh, we should have all of our code unit tested, literally every function. Um, that's very difficult to achieve. 
Um, and so there's additional forms of testing that you know, can make up for these very unrealistic expectations to test a percentage of your code. And we're gonna talk about that. Um, but really, you know, if we're looking at the entire pipeline for you know, build your code, test your code, um, then provide the infrastructure that's being tested by this code, it gets deployed, and then you run into issues because obviously there's one thing, the one thing you didn't test for broken production, and then you're gonna write tests for it retroactively, which is you know, an unfortunate reality of life like you know the earth being not flat for example um, which leads to time zones issues you know especially with remote work well i'm digesting here um, writing tests in with different granularity this one is a doozy because once you start talking about unit tests um you know you, you're suddenly like oh i need to spin up a web server and how do i do that and so we introduce end-to-end -end tests, which are at the top of the pyramid. If unit tests, you really test, you know, the most granular type of uh, testing, then end-to-end -end tests are literally what they say they are. They test your system end-to-end. -end. And uh, Arthur, I think you can talk about that. Yes, uh, thank you, Adam, for the great introduction. And here's the clicker. You're probably going to need it. Uh, okay. We're not mind synced yet. We're almost there. So uh, yeah, so we start with end-to-end um, -end tests. And in this presentation, we're going to build together this pyramid. You're going to see all type of layers that we have in our test infrastructure for Dapper. And uh, we expect that you can take some of those also for your project. Um, and you're going to notice that, like Adam mentioned, uh, really your test coverage for unit tests does not really mean a whole lot because what we're really looking for is coverage of scenarios. Uh, what are the scenarios that your user uh, uh, are using that will uh, actually be tested. So for example, I'm uh, using testing with Kubernetes, with kind, with version of Kubernetes I'm using. So there's so many combinations that can go uh, in the end-to-end -end tests. Uh, so let's start with how we started that route, the, the journey. Um, first, we deploy Kubernetes cluster. We have the Dapper control plane installed. We have Dapper with an, an application, a few applications running. We have a database because we want to implement the Dapper building blocks. So let's say state store. So you need a database for that. You need a broker because you might be using, um, you might be testing uh, PubSub. Uh, so, and then we go here above and we have a test code. The test code runs on GitHub Actions, but you can use whatever technologies you want. And that will exercise multiple scenarios in this complete installation of Dapper on top of Kubernetes. But just Kubernetes is not enough. So we run this on Kind and on Azure. And Kind here comes really handy, and that's one thing I highly recommend, which is it allows us to test the end-to-end -end tests at the pull request. We don't need to actually provision anything on Azure or any other cloud that we can add here, because Kind allows us to, run, to get a shorter term feedback, uh, shorter feedback from the pull request. So we have a pull request in Dapper. We make sure that the end-to-end -end tests pass even before we merge. So we want to have, that was like the, the very basic uh, foundation that we started testing Dapper. And I will just say, uh, GitHub action runners do not like kind. They're like, go away. Every time they say kind of it's like, I'm going to do everything I can to destroy you. I'm going <laughs> to mess up the network. I'm going to, you know, uh, screw up the file system. Everything can go wrong, can go wrong. But in the end, it's a really, really good thing. So yes, I do recommend putting kind in, inside of GitHub actions because it's much cheaper than, you know, uh, running the entire thing in the cloud, which might bankrupt you. Exactly. So thanks, Yara, for, for and so as you can see, going back to the, the, the slide, uh, that means that the upper you are in the pyramid, more integration, it's slower, but also flakier. So we cannot just put everything on the entrance test uh, part. Uh, so next step, performance tests. One of yeah, I'll talk about performance tests because I implemented them in Dapper, and I'm really proud of them. Um, so. Obviously, you know, want to test scenarios, want to test that certain actions of the, or certain aspects of the code aren't broken, but Dapper also really fronts your interactions with the underlying infrastructure. You use it to connect to your database and your PubSub and uh, to make them more secure. But we really want to make sure that Dapper is as performant as possible and that new code that gets checked in doesn't actually uh, cause regressions in terms of performance. So we have our performance tests, and these look kind of familiar or similar to uh, the ones in the end-to-end -end test. And 
what we're doing is we have applications that are talking to the Dapper APIs, they're saving state, and we run something called a baseline um, as opposed to the, the Dapper test. So we have a baseline test, which is the application goes to something like Redis directly, then we have the same app goes, go to Redis through Dapper to basically be able to measure the added latency and throughput uh, that Dapper is adding or degrading to uh, for that uh, specific scenario. And we are using um, Fortio, which is a project that is doing performance tests for Istio, um, and we're moving that over to K6S, which is a, a load testing tool on Kubernetes. Highly recommend using that one. The reason we moved from Fortio, which is used by Istio, to K6X is because Fortio doesn't have really good support for gRPC um, all the way uh, through. So the HTTP is really good with Fortio, gRPC mm, less of an experience, so we're moving everything to uh, K6X. And um, that allows us really to test the different Dapper building blocks end to end and see how much latency and uh, or throughput Dapper adds to each one of these scenarios. So in terms of their place in the stack, we're placing them right underneath end to end tests. Um, the yeah, I will also program. mention yes. that for Fortio, Fortio uh, we also contributed to a feature as our work on Dapper. Uh, if you go to Fortio, you can generate a dynamic URL with your UID. That was a feature contributed by us as part of our work with them. Yes, we like to contribute features to many frameworks that we use in Dapper and make them better for our use cases. All right, and then we have long haul tests. Arthur. Okay, um, so long haul tests, um, it's, we noticed that end to end tests and promise tests are not enough. Uh, again, go back to scenarios. Why? Because you run your tests, they might run for an hour, maybe two. Uh, ideally less than that, and then they end and they stop, but you don't really catch problems where the customer actually is running for a long time. So long haul means just running for a long period of time. So what we do is we created an app, uh, uh, simulating an application w using as many features of Dapper as we could, uh, and emitting messages, publishing messages, uh, using binding, using actors, uh, using state store, and that application is deployed on a real cluster, Kubernetes cluster, same deployment as end-to-end test, but it keeps running for like one day, two days. And we collect metrics throughout the period of, of this execution. And we, are, we look at the uh, regressions, for example, do we have a memory leak? Do we have a GoRoutine leak? And these things don't, you, you cannot, it's very hard to catch those on end-to-end -end tests. Uh, because it might take a while until you notice the leak. It might not be right away. It might take like hours for that to show up. And uh, these things, of course, don't, the pull request does not get blocked waiting by this. Of course, it, it is it's unsustainable. Uh, we have this uh, as part of our release processing topper. Well, we have put a release candidate into the long haul environment. But to reduce the feedback uh, time, we also have a daily long haul environment where every day we deploy uh, a build from master for the master branch into a different environment and we assess uh, at least on a weekly basis if there was any regression um, on these numbers. You're basically here simulating uh, a customer using your application, your, your um, platform or your framework in production. Uh, anything you want to add? Yes, we are tracking metrics through Prometheus endpoints of the Dapper sidecars as well as the Dapper control plane and we're looking at things that are very low level. It's not like, you know, test case scenarios, we're not looking at response error codes for, you know, HTTP or gRPC unavailable or anything like that. Looking at CPU, memory, number of Go routines, uh, file descriptors in the file system, things that really show up when you're running a process at scale uh, for a very long time. That is true, and one thing I'll let you add halfway through here is that you can see why reusability is a, it, it brings far more benefits than just moving light of code from the application to the sidecar. Because if you're building all of this yourself, all the connectivity to your, to your broker uh, or a state store, the abstractions, you have to set up a lot of these tests yourself. So when you're reusing the Dapper sidecar, you're not only reusing the features, you're also reusing all the test infrastructure that we set up and to guarantee that quality. So how do you guarantee consistent behavior across components? Yep, I'll take that one. Dapper has a concept of components. That's what connects the Dapper runtime into the different clouds. You know, for example, there is a pub sub component for Kafka, or a pub sub component for RabbitMQ, or a state store component for 
uh, MySQL. And as I mentioned before, we have over 150 of these and they have their own interfaces because they interact with the DAP runtime. So how do we make sure that each one of these cloud implementations adhere to the behavior we want to see uh, them exhibit in Dapper? Um, we have, uh, for example, here an, an application that is trying to get state from Dapper, and there is two different databases here, but they report a uh, key not found um, differently. One might return an empty result, while the other one might return it as an error. So we don't want the user who's calling into the API that's abstract, abstracting these two different state stores to get two different uh, examples or two different responses. And so Dapper really uh, provides a single consistent behavior. But we need to test these underlying implementations and components to make sure that we know that they behave according or that their implementations in Dapper behave according to what we need them to do. And so we have current foreman tests uh, here. And these are really type of contract tests, you can think about them. So we have the state stores, we have the PubSub. We're not running any form of uh, Kubernetes clusters here. This is the nice thing. We have a completely separate repository outside of the Dapper runtime that just has the implementation for these. Um, you know, Pulsar, for example. And so anytime we add a new uh, addition or feature to Pulsar, for example, um, we add a new test that basically verifies that Pulsar still behaves according to the same interface Face that Dapper um, should adhere by. And so we have this nice animation here done by Arthur. You're going to have to teach me that to do that. I, yes. Um, and so, you know, we run MongoDB and uh, then we run Kafka and we basically iterate over uh, each of these um, and we basically make sure that each one of them adheres to the uh, same conformant test. And these run also in GitHub Actions. We're not running it in Kubernetes because this is Go code. So we have a framework that we've written that basically um, kind of like mimics Dapper. It's not actually Dapper that's calling into these interfaces um, because these are individual implementations. You can even build them into their own binaries and run them if you want to. Uh, but we make sure that uh, we test them. And, and these conform tests are really quick. I think a whole suite of 150 tests today finishes in under 15 minutes. Am I lying to these fine people? Or I don't true? know. I have to yeah, look at it. Yeah, I, I haven't looked at them in a while because they run so well. You know, I don't have to look at how long it takes them to pass. But it's something like 15 minutes for the whole 100, 150. Um, and so component conformant tests, we put uh, above unit tests because they are still in code. They're not running in an actual compute environment. They're testing for more things than just individual functions. They're testing a component as a whole, but you know, they're not running inside of, you know, in compute environments like Kubernetes. So they are still in the lower part of the pyramid here. Um, yes, and, but is that enough? Arthur, answer that question. <laughs> Well, apparently never is enough. So what you can see is, what we notice is that some people were trying to use the upper components, let's say Kafka or, or MQTT. And the question was, well, it's, can I rely on that? Because you test it with the conformance test, but haven't tested as necessarily end-to-end -end test. Um, and we also noticed that there's some behavior that's specific to each component, for example, each component might have their own unique ways to provide authentication. Uh, will all those authentication solutions work for that component? Um, and also they have different material levels. Some of them have, might just have started in, implementation of the DAP interface. Some of them might be, might be have battle tested, even used in production in some cases. Uh, so to fix like this chicken and egg problem, like some people want to use a, com uh, a component, uh, but only if it's stable, and we were waiting to, for people to use it to call it stable, we decided to solve that with more tests. Uh, surprise. So, surprise. <laughs> so these are different type of tests. Uh, we call certification, certification tests, which is the last uh, thing that guarantees quality uh, for a given component. And in this case, it's a different approach. Uh, we have, first we started with a test plan. Uh, has anyone here written a test plan before? Okay. A few people have, okay, good. So you're basically planning your test. That's what it does. <laughs> um, and in this case, um, a maintainer will, a, a contributor will submit a, uh, a test plan. A maintainer will review it to see if the scope of the test is sufficient to guarantee quality. And the certification tests are, per, are written, customized per component using the DAPR APIs. So we actually load a whole, an entire sidecar as a library in, in, the, in the test framework we have and test each component one by one. And uh, this process also runs as part of the pull requests. 
Um, in some cases, if you, if in, in case of Kafka, for example, it will hit against um, a particular container. If we talk about an AWS service, for example, we use local stack, and before you merge, after you merge, we run that against a real AWS uh, endpoint. Um, so this is a way for us to guarantee that there is quality against a given component. And if there's any regression or any new bug found, it either it usually becomes a new test scenario in the certificate test, or it can be um, a missed scenario back in the conformance test that we saw before. The advantage is that once you change your conformance test, we haven't talked about that, you end up having to update multiple components because you're basically adding a new test to the contract that not every component adheres to. So you might only fix one component but multiple implementations. And let's go back to the matrix where like you have Dapper with multiple uh, components, multiple SDKs. It's kind of a complex uh, um, mix of scenarios to be tested. So it's basically never is enough. Uh, so we put this right above conformance test because, again, it's using with the Dapper sidecar as a library. So that's more integration. And that gave us this uh, was a top, very requested feature in uh, 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 process in Dapper where people say, can I use this particular component? And you can co contribute with a component. You start with alpha, which means you don't guarantee, you don't guarantee even that it behaves that it's supposed to behave. Uh, but it's a way for you to get it started. You can quickly add it to the conformance tests and they give you beta status. And then once you add a certi uh, certification test um, and it's approved by a maintainer, it becomes stable. And automatically, you also get a guarantee of no breaking change. So there's no breaking change between uh, version upgrades in Dapper. There's a deprecation path, of course, when once you remove things. But it, don't have, it, you don't have, do hap it doesn't happen within uh, a single version upgrade. Do you want to add anything? No. No? OK. Um, luckily, uh, but still found bugs. I want to rush up a little bit more because of the time. Uh, but we have more automation. We had integration tests as the case. So I'm, I'm the author and maintainer of the Java SDK. And we added something called integration tests in this case, where you write the test for the Java SDK, which means the test is also written in Java. You have Java apps running using the sidecar, but you don't run a Kubernetes anymore. You run in standalone mode. So, if, uh, this, so this last integration, then the enter and test, is faster to run. And what we noticed multiple times is that as testing from the client perspective, because imagine the SDK test that you're testing from the client's perspective, we end up catching bugs that were not caught in the runtime. So the Java SDK end up having additional scenario coverages to the end-to-end -end test. So it was one more layer of testing to protect against bugs uh, to our users. And all our all, all the SDKs also end up having um, integration tests in the future. Uh, so we put it right above the integration test because it exercises components, it exercises the sidecar running standalone mode, but it's not quite as integrated as end-to-end -end test, which is a, a complete vertical stack. Uh, what about CLI? Well, CLI had its own test pyramid, and we don't have time to talk about CLI today, so that will be probably another talk. Uh, what about quick starting tutorials? Maybe that's one of the things that uh, we can also take from this talk. Uh, we have automation for that as well. Because imagine releasing Dapper and having to retest all the quick starts and, and getting started guides manually. Uh, I'm pretty sure who here has uh, any kind of getting started or manual instructions in, in Markdown? No, people use Markdown, okay, so people use Markdown, great. We have automated tests for that on a new tool, the uh, relative new tool that we build as part of the working Dapper. It's unrelated to Dapper, you can use that without using a project at all. It's called Mechanical Markdown. Uh, you basically automate tests for Markdown documents with shell commands. So if you wanna get started off automating your instructions or your commands, you can even have a quick end-to-end -end test just with Markdown file. Here's how it works. You, it's written in Python, so you just start with pip install, or pip3, depends on how you use your environment set up. You run with mm.py and the markdown file. In your markdown file, you're gonna have bash commands. In this case, just do hello world, but you can have things more complex than that. And you annotate with this comment, comment here, called step, and you put the name, and you put what is the expectations. There are more configurations, but we cannot go deep too much into this today. 
uh, and then you end the annotation here. And what it does is mechanical markdown will understand this uh, annotation and will execute this command and assert the output is the same as you have put. Uh, so this is a quick way to automate uh, documentation testing in your project. Uh, so if, even if you don't want to use Dapper or you don't know about Dapper, is Mechanical Markdown is a core part of our project and we think all the open source projects, even private uh, projects can also benefit from it. Uh, and this is an example of how it looks. You can validate the C Sharp quick starts, the Go quick starts, the Java, the JavaScript, the Python. Imagine all of that multiplied by all the building blocks that Dapper has it will be impossible to test manually on every release. So this gives us uh, a really good automation and it's one of our, our most stable tests right now because there's, there's some flakiness as well to be tackled. Um, and how does it look like? The markdown looks the same. There's no difference. So when you look at the markdown, you absolutely look at, don't see any difference. The, these are all the commands that the, the mechanic markdown will execute just as the, your user will, use, will run on their terminal. And then we'll run Dapper. It doesn't need to be Dapper, it's just an example. And then the output, it can even assert complex log outputs. Uh, even if things are out of order, uh, Mechanical Markdown can make assertions for outputs out of order. It's just a different flag. And how it works, it, it, there's a Dapper CLI. In this case, Dapper CLI ends, enters the equation. Mechanical Markdown, we read, read the file, execute all the commands on the CLI. And this CLI will run those uh, against the Dapper control plane and the apps that are running. It can be Java, it can be JavaScript. And in this case, it runs in standalone mode. Uh, we don't test this necessarily on Kubernetes, but it can. It's just a matter of uh, your choice. So we put, ex I call it example tests uh, right above SDK integration. It's a deeper level of integration, but not as much as end-to-end -end tests. So, and want to talk about the ice cream cone? Yes, I love ice cream. So I kind of hijacked that uh, slide from you. End-to-end um, -end tests are slow, they take an hour to an hour and a half today to run in Dapper. They consume a lot of power and energy, of course. And you know, Dapper is a fast-paced project. We have more than 3,000 individual contributors. We have multiple PRs coming in every day. It's a very thriving project. And we need to make sure that tests do not become a bottleneck. So end-to-end -end tests, once they become too big, you know, the more features you add, the longer they will take because you're testing for more uh, scenarios. So we've decided to add more tests to solve that. We're fighting <laughs> tests with tests, ladies and gentlemen, yes. Um, and so we have integration tests. And integration tests allow us to automate the sidecar process outside of Kubernetes. Kubernetes is the slow thing. Uh, is anyone here surprised? Mm. Probably not. So we can actually run something very similar to the end-to-end -end test infrastructure uh, just by automating the sidecar itself from within a GitHub Actions runner, but that doesn't have to be a GitHub Actions runner. It can be literally anything um, if you want to run your own CACD stack, for example. And so we are now adding more and more integration tests um, because they are faster and they're less flaky than end-to-end -end tests. So in many respects, they're actually more reliable and the logs output they give us are sometimes much more accurate than the log outputs we're getting from an end-to-end -end test that is failing. And so this is the end of the uh, pyramid where we show you the different trade-offs between integration and isolation, but we think we've covered pretty much everything. Um, we would love it if someone told us now what kind of tests we didn't add because we love to add tests. So yes, if there is any form of test you think we should be adding, please come and talk to us. We will probably do that. Um, let's talk about refactorings, N not really necessarily uh, you know, related to uh, testing, but Refactoring code is a major pain and we, we don't like to do that. Um, for Dapper specifically, sometimes someone would come with a PR and they would go like, oh, I refactored 2,000 lines of code. And then we maintainers sometimes become the, you know, the bad cops because we're like, well, you know what? That's, that might actually reduce the stability of the project and then people might get offended sometimes. And so we need to have very clear and established rules about when do we do refactorings, when do you communicate those, how do you communicate those, so that there is a clear setting of expectation about what the refactoring is doing. You know, sometimes developers like to refactor things just because they can. And so we can't allow that to happen in Dapper. Um, and yes, yeah, so there's this list of uh, do's and don'ts. You can uh, read that here. I don't think we have enough time to cover everything. Arthur, is there anything you, that's important for you to say for this list. Yes. Yeah. Don't mix change, uh, intentional change with refactor. So if you're, the refactor should have no behavior oh, change no. in your code. 
if you mix that, it becomes a mess because now you don't know if it's a regression or if it's intended change. Yeah, it's, it's the greatest temptation, right? You're working on a feature, but then you notice, like, you notice this small piece of code that you're like, oh, I can make that better. It has nothing to do with my change, but I, 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 I'm, I can make that algorithm so much better. I can improve the, the time space complexity. I'm just gonna do that and push that with my code and that's all just gonna be fine. And then you wake up at 2 a.m. and you find out that basically when you've decided to make that change, you've signed a deal with your, the, the devil, but the devil was yourself. So we wanna <laughs> avoid that very much. And yes, you need to be intentional. Do you want to do a refactor? That's great. Do the feature change you wanted to do, then issue another PR, talk to a maintainer, ask if that's okay. You know, it doesn't have to be a maintainer. If, if you're taking this approach in your own environment, talk to the, the team lead or the developer who last worked on the code or the developer who is, you know, on the hook to uh, maintain that code long-term and discuss the refactor. Refactorings are dangerous. They should have really good reasons. And we can go move yep. forward. All right, now flaky tests, Arthur. Um, so flaky tests is an ongoing effort. It doesn't stop. And it actually became, as you saw, we added so many test uh, scenarios that, and test levels that uh, flakiness became a part of our day-to-day -day troubleshooting. Uh, it was still not perfect, so there's a lot of a long road ahead of us to get that butcher with a stable uh, uh, test suite. Uh, but uh, some, some things that people might remember, but still good call out, don't do IO on unit test. So if you're unit tested to do service invocation, write your disk, read, read from disk, um, it's not a unit test. It's integration test at least. So make sure you don't do any IO. Unit tests just work. Um, and then also don't rerun failed tests until they pass without looking at the test failures. Why? Some bugs, especially in a distributed runtime, are not deterministic which means that might be some risk condition that you might not be handling correctly, and just by running that, you hide the risk condition, thinking it's a test flaky problem, uh, test flakiness problem. Um, another thing, it's possible run unit tests and integration tests multiple times before merging PRs. Uh, some IDEs actually have this feature. You can, write, you can configure your IDE to run the same test 10 times. So try to run your same unit test 10 times in a row, see how many times it passes. Uh, if it's 100%, you have a higher chance of that not being flaky. Uh, and uh, it's also interesting to build reports of flaky test scenarios because sometimes in most systems, only one test failure is enough to fail the whole run. So you call, you're seeing like 50, 70, 80% test failure uh, rate in your test suite, but it might be caused by only one or two tests. So don't be scared that your test is like super flaky. It might be just one or two culprits. Uh, and look at good first issues to help the community if you're dealing with open source project. Can we move on? And uh, takeaways, yep, so the takeaways uh, from today's talk. Uh, have contract tests to guarantee consistent behavior across clouds. Uh, so in a multi-cloud runtime, the behavior might not be consistent across clouds. So in that, you need to have those, those type of tests. Um, run your end-to-end tests in multiple clouds. Uh, that is one thing that's ongoing for us, where we want to take the end-to-end -end test and run on AWS as well. Uh, we, don't, we run today on Kind, which is local host, and we also run on, AW, on, on Azure, but that's mostly a cost thing. Uh, as soon as we get more credits, we're going to put on Azure as well, and AWS, sorry, and AWS and, and GCP. Um, have wait, long wait, 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 we, we, we need to plug ourselves in here. If there's any Amazon or AWS people in the crowd, please give us credits, that's it. Okay, oh, you can continue. We, we accept, yeah, that's a great crowd. Help open source. And then, yeah, so diverse set of tests. Know your test scenarios before refactoring and writing. Avoid the ice cream cone problem, which when you have too many tests on the top layer, you want to have more tests at the bottom than at the top. And automate your, your getting started, your documentation with mechanical markdown. And get, claim your supporter icon. If you have that, you can scan your QR code. Claim for Dapper supporter, claim that. And you can give us feedback here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any questions? Um, yep. Thanks for the talk, guys. Amazing sure. stuff. Too much testing, to be honest. <laughs> Thank you. Um, just curious, how you analyze the results of long haul tests? Do you also have to make the analysis of the results? Because it's a very tricky one. Um, can I take that? No, you can. Okay, so long haul tests, um, it can be automated to look at the results, especially the obvious problems like CPU and memory, uh, CPU and memory number of coroutines. Yeah. Uh, we did look at bringing some of the scenario tests for long haul uh, lower into the pyramid, 
where we run like a simple sidecar for like 10 minutes to detect uh, obvious uh, go routine leak. Um, but you can automate some of that through metrics and alerts. So if you have alerts for your system, you can plug that in uh, into your long haul test and you can look at the alerts that get fired and that will be really close to an automation. Like you should see like zero alerts depending on the alerts you have. So uh, having alerts and monitoring we can help you also automate the long haul test results set. Yeah. But the rest of the stuff you just review manually, periodically. Right now we do manually because just a few tests, a, a few spots, we look at the graph and we say, okay, it's, it's good or bad, uh, but you can automate as well. It's, it's yes. a possibility to automate. Every release we have a long haul test lead and that person basically looks at the long haul test, they look at the metrics and they analyze it. Yeah. Thank you. And yeah. uh, last but not least, you mentioned what type of testing is missing. It's chaos testing. You didn't do Chaos, yeah, chaos, chaos testing. Yes. Oh, chaos tests, yes. Yeah. Actually, that's right. Um, so yes, list. yep. Yeah, we have that actually on our to-do list. Yep. We have an issue for that. Yep. <laughs> and nobody picked it up yet, but yes, we don't have chaos testing. Yes, thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> and that's really important. Thanks again. Yeah. Great questions. Okay. All right, anything else? No. no. Looks like we're good. So thank you again. Thank you.